Okay, let's begin this evening with prayer. Father, uh, as we just continue in our study of uh, the election, predestination, items uh, in your word, Father, that are, are clearly there, help us, Father, to get a clarity of understanding as to exactly what is meant by these terms, Father what you were trying to convey to us. And Lord, let, if that's to be through me, Father, that those ideas are conveyed, then, Father, just so be it. But, Lord, within each of us, may the teaching be done by the Holy Spirit this night. May there be a clarity of our doctrine, a clarity of our theology, not in the sense of being heady, Father, because that's not what we want to become, as heady and prideful. But in our ability to stand clearly in our faith, Lord. And so, Lord, we just ask you to be the teacher tonight. Help us to put aside our days and the things that have hassled us and, and caused us all kinds of problems and are just constantly coming at us, Father, this evening and may try to push its way into our minds. But just help, let us help. Help us to focus, Father on those things that you would show us tonight. So, Lord, we just give you this night. We dedicate it to you. We pray that this night glorify you, Father, in Jesus' name. Of course, the two chapters uh, which you either did or didn't read was on predestination in the Old Testament and predestination in the New Testament. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. I do want to make some major points, and I do want to uh, spend some time in a couple of areas, but I'm not going to spend time in Ecclesiastes and Proverbs and, and the kinds of things that they went through in that particular chapter in any great depth. First of all, to begin with, predestination is not a word that is used in Old Testament scripture. Yet predestination and the concept of predestination seems to be there. The real question is, how is it manifested in the Old Testament writings? Well, we're going to look at it not from isolated verses, although we could do that, but because of the great body of writing that the Old Testament comprises, it's almost impossible to do any justice to it. So I feel like by going through a couple of sections, we'll be able to get a clear idea of what form predestination seems to take in the Old Testament. And we'll try to deal with it in terms of larger contexts in which those particular things occur. This is, uh, in essence, biblical theology, though. Biblical theology takes in, in, in a large body of writing and deals with it within its context and what the major thought is that's trying to be put across by taking it within that context rather than through the systematic method of withdrawing it from the scriptures. We're going to attempt to discover predestinarian ideas in various forms of literature as to their form, what form do these ideas take, in other words, and what role do they play. So we're going to look at it in two senses, the predestinarian ideas in Old Testament scripture as to what form do these ideas take and what role do they seem to play? First of all, in A, Genesis, the patriarchal histories comprising a body of scripture as your outline tells you from Genesis chapter 12 through 50. Looking at the patriarchal histories in Genesis, the theme is simply stated, the survival and the growth of the family of Abraham. If we look at that body of scripture, the theme stated in its simplest form is the survival and the growth of the family of Abraham. This might be not a bad place to kind of take our minds back to another point too, so that we don't just isolate these chapters from the rest of the things that we've read up to this point. And that being, let's, let's consider election. Election in this particular sense in terms of Old Testament scripture 
election, the election of the nation of Israel. Remember what the election of the nation of Israel was for. The election of the nation of Israel was to usher in the Messiah. So try and keep that in your minds as we go through this section on Abraham. Remember clearly that Abraham is a movement in that direction. We could go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 where it's, it talked about the seed of woman and all of those kinds of things that tended to be prophetical in their approach and yet at the same time in that prophecy was a promise to be brought forth within that prophecy. And so as we look into Genesis and we look at the patriarchal histories in terms of Abraham, understand that Abraham is that attempt to move in that direction. For the nation of Israel to become that, that body of people who would then usher in the Messiah. The promise, basically within this area, is that they will live and multiply. There is a promise here within this, this body of scriptures. And that promise is that they will live and that they will multiply. And the second aspect of this is the, then the threats to that survival of this family. The promise is, is that they will live and that they will multiply the family of Abraham. And then set against that is the threats to the survival of this family. The form predestination takes here. As I said, we were gonna look at what form do these ideas take. The form that predestination takes here is the promise. The promise automatically makes us look forward in time. In other words, predest predestination in this sense, dealing with a predetermination, means that something is being looked forward to in the future. And within that sense, there is a promise. And the promise is long-term intentions which God alone will bring about. The promise is a long-term intention which God alone will bring about. Now that's in its large sense. More specifically, the promise is a promise of descendants, number one. It's a promise of a land, number two. It's a promise of divine blessing, number three. And number four, it's a promise of blessing to the Gentiles. So to go back and restate, the promise in its, long, in its large sense is long-term intentions which God alone will bring about. In other words, that promise is, is a long-range projection of intentions which God intends to bring about in time. But specifically, it's a promise of four things. First of all, it's a promise of descendants. It's a promise of land or a land, specifically a land. It's a promise of divine blessing, number three. And it's a promise of blessing to the Gentiles. In each case, this points to the future in which all of this will be realized. Abraham's response is not that of thanksgiving, but rather of faith, that these things will come about. Abraham's response is a response of faith that indeed these things will come about. It's not a matter of question. It's not open to question. It's simply the, the reaction of obedience and faith that these things will be realized. Also, this predestination or this predestinarian idea dealing with the, the promise is not for the sake exclusively of those who are predestined, but for the sake of world blessing. 
This particular aspect of predestination is not for the sake exclusively of those who are being predestined at this point in time. In other words, this predestination is not dealing with just those, Abraham and his family, per se, for the, but it's really a predestination that extends far beyond Abraham into world blessing. Keeping clearly in mind the concept of election, I think you can understand that because actually what's happening is, is that what we're getting is the major push and the major emphasis towards the ushering in of the Messiah. This is not a new concept. We talked about this earlier, I think in the very first night when we talked about Noah. I think we talked about him in that same context. Uh, in that, in the introduction, we spoke about Noah in the sense of, well, let me go back a little bit and think of it like this. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It doesn't say anything about the fact that his family found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But at the same time, it wasn't just Noah who got in the boat. It was Noah and his family. So that extended beyond Noah then into his family. And then later on would extend further on then into all of mankind. So even though... Someone asked the question last time, do you believe that Noah understood that forward thinking at the time this took place? And I'd have to say that the, probably the chances are slim and none that Noah understood that. Because what we have to understand is, is that all of this is taking place within the framework of everyday living. We uh, many times, I think, take Noah out of context and deal with him strictly as some kind of isolated little situation here that's not in a framework of a society or a social system where people are all interacting with each other and there is just as much craziness in his life, perhaps, as there is in ours. If you were predestined in some way to do something, it takes place within the context of everything that you're doing in your life. Likewise with Noah. Same thing happened with him. It took place within the context of his everyday living. And for us to try and see ahead is, is extremely difficult to do. You do the same thing with, uh, as we go through Old Testament scripture, you could take many of the prophets, uh, and certainly the one that comes to mind at the most ready because I've taught it so many times, is Habakkuk who was in the position of, God, why are you doing this? Why are you bringing the Chaldeans? And the Chaldeans come, they take the people away, and we don't, but there was no way that Habakkuk was going to see Daniel in any part of this or any of the other situations that were going to take place after they were removed. So God was actually moving within that whole situation. Yet for him, it was just an, an act that was taking place in his everyday living. And that's the same thing with us, the same thing with Noah. Yet the extension of the thing was actually much far more far-reaching than any way, any uh, concept that Habakkuk could have had. It must be remembered that this does not preclude salvation in the personal sense, for instance, Noah's case. Noah experienced salvation. He experienced it in a personal sense. He was saved. He was placed in the ark with his family and he was saved. But it doesn't necessarily speak in the personal sense in Noah's case. We do see a type of salvation for Noah, but in the typical sense, it speaks to atonement and salvation in the future via the Messiah to come. Now, let me explain that again because it kind of goes back to the early uh, point of Soteriology I and foundational studies. And that is this, that Noah, when he was out there caulking the boat with pitch, in no way was thinking that pitch is the same word that's also used for atonement. And therefore, that which is keeping the waters of judgment out of the ark, the only thing he was thinking of was pitching the boat. And so the waters come, the boat floats, 
I, I don't for one minute think that Noah was sitting there thinking atonement. Why would atonement come into his mind anyway? Yet there may be a typical sense, a type of that which is to come. And that is, is that judgment is held back by the atonement to come. So there may be a statement being made here by this in the typical sense or type of Christ yet to come of holding back salvation or holding back judgment by the atonement. But in no way did Noah really have the ability perhaps to see that unless God made some kind of revelation to Noah. And if he did so, we don't know that by scripture. Number two, the role of the patriarchal stories. One could come to the conclusion that since the promise comes before all that happens, there can be no real crisis that call the promise into question, but only the outworking of divine intentions which are seen by those in this section of scripture as inevitable. I'll go back through that statement again. That statement comes from something that's found in your book, and I wanted to make this point and wanted to bring this point out in class, so that's why it sounds so complicated. One could come to the conclusion that since the promise comes before all that happens, since the promise comes before everything else that happens, there can be no real crisis that call the promise into question. But remember that all of this is taking place and that there is tension being created by everything that seems to try and stop the promise from happening. And that's the kind of thing that takes place within the real life framework that's taking place. But, only, but the only thing that can happen, according to many thinking, many thoughts, people's thinking is, is that only the outworking of divine intentions can actually take place, which are seen by those in this section of scripture as inevitable. In other words, the people in scripture operate by faith that this is going to happen. No matter what, this is going to happen. Yet, there is still those kinds of things that take place that create a tension in this particular situation. If we deal with man as a free will agent, we cannot deal with him at the same time as if he is a predetermined person or a person as a robot. We have to deal with him either as a free will agent or as that kind of agent who is making all of his moves totally as a result of God moving him from place to place Everything he says is straight from God. Everything he does is straight from God. And he is literally being moved through his motions. God is bringing him through every single situation and every single motion and movement. Thus, we have seen the tension in this portion of scripture as resistive forces versus the fulfillment of the promise. And resistive forces take place within free will agents. If there are free will agents, if man has indeed a free will, then it's easy to find tension because can God's will be resisted? Or can it not be resisted? Is the question that comes up. If it can, then can that create a tension in terms of the fulfillment of the promise as a result of that? Though we see these roadblocks to God's plan, we also see God's plan moving toward its fulfillment. Though we see these resistances to God's will, we at the same time see the fulfillment constantly moving forward. We do not see predestination exhibited as a plan of personal salvation to hell or heaven, though we may see it in a larger sense of blessing to all mankind. There appears not to be 
a predestination to heaven and hell within this, the Old Testament scriptures in this section. There appears to be none of that. Although it does appear to be, in a larger sense, a blessing to all mankind. This predestination is God's will, purpose, or plan coming about within the realities of life in a world system and a philosophical framework set against it. Now, bear in mind that even though we're talking about this in the sense of the Old Testament, this is still happening in the New Testament. God is going to bring about his sovereign plan for end times. He is still working in man. Man is still being used of God. And that time is indeed going to come about. And so if you think about it in that sense, we are constantly progressing towards that end. Those of us who are born again live in the faith that indeed that is going to happen. We believe fully that it is indeed going to happen. Yet we also see constantly people resisting the will of God. So that's what I'm speaking of, is that there are free will agents, and those free will agents are resistive. But at the same time, we constantly see the movement to that end just like we do in this particular sense. So my comment was basically this, that we see prede the, the predestination, which is God's will or God's purpose or God's plan, is coming about. But it's coming about within the realities of life, people, and living, and in a world system or cosmos, if you wish, and a philosophical framework, or aeon is the Greek, set against it. The world is set against God's plan coming about, both in its philosophical framework and in its world systems. Yet at the same time, it's coming about. Yes? Can God's plan work through just any person? Well, I'd have to say yes if we consider Cyrus as being used of God in the Old Testament situation. The Jews were not happy about Cyrus being used. They were irritated at that. And God rebuked them for it. He said, what right does the pot have to tell God that he should have handles or not? God has the right to do it. But earthen vessels argue with earthen vessels, not with the Creator. So I'd say, yeah. So basic, yes, I'm sorry, Who, Liz, yeah. I'm, I'm ready to summarize, huh? I have to see if I got it. Right. Though the world system is set against God's plan, His plan is still carried through. Is that what you put for summary? Yeah. I really haven't gotten to summary yet. I've got three points to make. I thought, I thought you were summary. You were kind of summary. I was summarizing what I had already been saying okay. up to that point, yeah. Well, That's okay. There. You can leave it there. <laughs> you can correct anything with arrows, can't you, Liz? <laughs> okay. The number three, the summary and summary. Number one. The Old Testament does not seem to indicate a predestination of individuals to particular acts. The Old Testament does not seem to indicate a predestination of individuals to particular acts, which means that they remain free will agents. They are not being forced into doing anything. That does not mean that God does not use individuals. It simply means that he does not force them to do things. But rather, they remain free will agents, even though he continues to use them. Then number two, the Old Testament does not support a predetermined destiny to heaven or hell. 
the Old Testament does not seem to support a predetermined destiny to heaven or to hell. And parenthetically, in terms of individuals or groups, it makes no difference. There appears to be no predestination for individuals to heaven or hell, and there appears to be no position for groups of people in terms of large groups as the elect of Israel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the third position, when it speaks of God's purposes, they usually appear as specific and comparatively short term. When it speaks of God's purposes in the Old Testament, they usually appear as specific things and comparatively short term things. That's usually. There are, however, long range promises whose fulfillment God sees too. So the greatest majority of the Old Testament scriptures seem to support the fact that predestination does not seem to refer to salvation or not salvation. It seems to speak more towards purposes and tasks or, or directions that God wants to move in. And in each case, they tend most of the time to be short-term, but that does not mean that they're not long-term. There are long-term purposes as well, promises whose fulfillment God indeed sees to, and many have taken place as you read through Scripture. That's one of the neat things about the Old Testament. You see the promises happening. The promise of the Messiah indeed has happened, and yet, Think of the time frame that was involved from its promise in Genesis 3 to its fulfillment. Okay. Predestination in the New Testament, however, is an altogether different situation. The New Testament word to predestinate which we'll look at a little bit more here in a second, occurs four times. The New Testament word to predestinate occurs four times. Do I have these on your outline for you already? Okay, good. I wanted to get these down for you to cut down on some of your writing. It occurs four times. Secondly, the Greek word that we speak of is pro-orizo, which is, uh, it's already written down for you. Uh, the last O can have a long sign over it, a little line over the top, so it's pro-orizo. And there are some scriptures which will give you those four places. First of all, it's found in Romans 8.29. It's also found in Romans 8.30. And it's also found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 11. Now that's the four times that we find it in the terms of predestinate. The same word translated to determine before, in other words, in Acts 4.28, the same word is translated to mean to determine before. Acts 4.28 is translated that way usually instead of predestinate. And it's translated to ordain in 1 Corinthians 2.7. So that word is found six times in Scripture. Four times it's translated predestinate in some way, and once it's translated to determine before in Acts, and once it's translated to ordain in 1 Corinthians 2.7. Now, two versions of Scripture, the ASV and the RV, translate the, all of these six places, 
as foreordained. As a matter of fact, that's one of the aspects of the RV, the revised version. One of the aspects was, and the authors of the ASV and the RV, the ASV is just the American version of the English version of the revised. They're both the same version. One just happens to be American, the other is English. But the authors of those particular versions decided right off that any time the same word is used in the Greek, that they would translate that word the same way every time it appears, that they would not translate it any other way. That's not the case in the AV or any others. Okay. The word predestination in English, as in Greek, in both cases, refers to an act of decision prior to a later action. The word predestination in English, as in the Greek, refers to an act of decision prior to a later action. I'm still under A, which is the New Testament word to predestinate. And so you can put it anywhere in there between A and B. <laughs> Sure. The uh, word predestination, both in English as well as the Greek, refer to an act of decision prior to a later action. And I'll try and put that in uh, some kind of framework that we can all use. If you determine to do something before you do it, that is the same thing as predestination. To decide to do something before you do it and then follow that act out is the act of predestination. It simply means to predetermine, to determine beforehand before you do something. If you decide that I'm going to walk from here to the backstage, then what you have is predetermined something. And that word in the Greek is proorizo. So it's not supposed to be something that is very complicated. Can man predetermine or predestine? Yes, man can. Just as I said, I'm going to walk back there to the stage. But is there something that can keep me from doing that? Yes, there is. I can break my leg between here and there. And then I don't walk back there. I crawl or, or drag myself or whatever. Uh, so the difference between predestination in, in terms of God and in terms of man is the limitations that are placed on us. In other words, God's predeterminations will take place. But in the case of man, man's predeterminations or predestination is based on his own limitations. In the case of willing or purposing, there must be, by their very nature, a decision take place before the action willed or purposed. Now, let me put it to you this way. If I will something or if I purpose something, if, I say, if, if we're talking about willing something, if we're talking about purposing to do something, there must be, by their very nature, a decision take place before the action willed or purposed. In other words, both of these are a type of planning kind of action. In other words, when you see these words, though this word is not, tra not in the Greek, pro orizo, it still carries with it the idea of planning something before it's carried out. By its very nature, it carries that with it. So therefore, because of that, they are types or forms of predestination. B, one. Factors in the situation. We're talking about the language of predestination as applied to God. 
You know, I want to do something before I do this. I, uh, I'd like to go to the textbook. I don't want to ignore it. There, I avoided a situation on the outlines for a particular reason. I didn't want to drive the uh, secretaries crazy trying to go through all of the Greek words. But your book goes through a particular section in the very first of the New Testament uh, predestination section that talks about the words used and how they're used and what they particularly mean. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in the Greek, but I think it's pretty wise that we go there and that we realize that predestination is not simply the same word always. Predestination involves many different words and has wit, carries with it a little different idea of predestination. So if you have your textbook with you, there is a section in chapter 7, right at the very first. And I'm going to start on page 127 at the bottom, the last paragraph. The Greek word is thus comparatively rare in the New Testament, but of course the idea is much more widespread. Now that's what I want to bring out. It's not just the word, but the idea or the thought behind it that our author focuses on. And I think that's a good idea because too many times we get balled up in, in teaching or in our reading and we hit that word predestination and we say, whoa, uh, we must be talking about to heaven or to hell or one thing or another. And that's not the case necessarily. It's the thought behind the word that's most important. That's one of the reasons why word studies are so much, uh, usually expand <laughs> our studies because they seem to expand on our ideas or our thoughts behind those particular words. Uh, predestination in English, as in Greek, and as this is something I gave you in your notes, refers to an act of decision prior to a later action. One decides beforehand what one is later going to do. This means that all proverbs, now, you might say predestination doesn't begin with P-R-O. No, it doesn't. It begins with P-R-E. But pro orizo does. The P-R-O in front of the Greek word, pro orizo, anytime there's a verb with pro in front of it, it refers to God purposing or choosing in advance, and it must come to our field of interest in that sense. So anytime you're doing a word study, if you see P-R-O, you can understand that, that that first three letters means that there is a determination beforehand before the action goes. And why action? Because it has to be in front of a verb. And verbs are action, usually. And so with that mind in mind, the pro means that there is a determination before that action is carried out, whatever that action happens to be. Such verbs can, of course, be used of human purposing. Thus, Paul speaks of the Corinthians making their gifts each as he made up his mind, pro aromai. And in sec that's in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Of course, there are many such verbs which simply indicate that one action preceded another. Prophets can foresee what is going to happen. That is to say, see it before it happens and foretell it or forewrite it and it gives you a number of scriptures to go to to check those things out. In the same way, God, who was of course the inspirer of the prophets, can have foreknowledge of what is going to happen or of particular people. A special case, in where, uh, a special case is where Jesus and his career are said to be foreknown by God in Acts 2.23 and 1 Peter 1.20. But God also prepares things beforehand for his people and chooses people beforehand for various tasks. Uh, gives a number of uh, references uh, and then it says in some of these cases in reference to Messiah and the verb protithemi 
which can be used in this way with the meaning to purpose or to plan beforehand. In Romans 1.13, it refers to a purpose of Paul, which had been thwarted. And in Ephesians 1.9, it's used of God's purpose of salvation. The corresponding prothesis, purpose or plan, is more frequent and refers to God's purpose in Romans 8.28, 9.11, Ephesians 1.11, 3.11, 2 Timothy 1.9. Finally, we may note that the preposition pro, before, can be used to refer to things that God planned, promised, or did before the creation of the world. Not necessarily, but can mean that. In many of the above texts, the use of the word pro is strictly unnecessary, since it is obvious that willing and purposing must, by their very nature, precede the action willed and purposed. We may perhaps compare the increasing use of pre in such phrases as pre-packaged vegetables. In other words, they're packaged before they're placed on the counter or the shelves. Pre-packaged vegetables are identical with packaged vegetables when they reach the shopper's table. But this means that all texts which God has described as willing, planning, and purposing must also come within our survey since here, too, we are concerned with acts of predestination. So we must note the use of thalo, to will, and of thalema, will. This verb can be used to express what God desires and what God actually wills to happen. Sometimes the dividing line between these two is not absolutely clear. Now, the reason I'll go through this is because I want you to understand that as you go through this, you realize there are more verbs that can be used that speak to a predestinarian thought than just pro orizo. So, if any of you are into doing a lot of uh, word studies in your own particular study, I'd suggest you read that section beforehand, beforehand. Pro pre-study, pre-read, <laughs> that kind of section before you, you uh, get into that because it, some of those words, if you do those word studies, then you say, oh yeah, I remember that. That's got kind of a predestinarian idea. And you go back and you read it and you suddenly it kind of puts a new twist to some of the things you're reading. Okay, now back to 2B1 which is the language of predestination is applied to God. As the language applies to man, it takes on a very personal nature. For example, one, willing and purposing is an essential attribute of persons. We decide to do things. We purpose to do certain kinds of things. They can make plans. We're talking about people. We can make plans, we can form intentions, and act to carry them out. We can desire and resolve to do things, but may not be able to carry it out or put it into effect because circumstances may prevent us. And this includes our own physical limitations. What happens when we use this kind of personal language to speak of God? First, what is the Bible using this language to express? One, the Bible is using this kind of language to express that God is personal. The Bible uses this kind of language to express that God is personal. He can will and purpose. Because God can will to do things and purpose to do things, that makes him very personal. Secondly, God is sovereign. Ultimately, his purpose for the universe will be achieved. In other words, the things he purposes and plans or wills to do will happen. Thus, it's an expression of God's sovereignty. Thirdly, it's an expression that God is gracious. 
because the salvation of sinful men depends entirely on his, the gracious act of his son, which he willed and purposed to do. So we see the expression of God as personal, sovereign, and gracious, all expressed through his own personal will and purpose, desire that all men be saved, that all men come unto him. Now set against these three points, we find that men are personal and have wills of their own. Thus, we face the possibility of opposition to the will of God. I'm kind of taking us back in the New Testament now to the old thought of promise or purpose or will and the tension that's brought about in the opposition part of it. Men are personal and they have wills of their own and thus we face the possibility of opposition to the will of God. Secondly, evil exists. And this kind of takes us back to the thought where I spoke of aeon and cosmos before. As a factor which is contrary to the will of God and of which God is not the author. In other words, we have difficulty fitting this into God's plan. This is one of the things that creates a problem for us. And thirdly, some men aren't saved. And the implication is that grace was not shown to them and thus grace was bestowed arbitrarily. Okay, let's look at them kind of together now. First of all, God is personal. He can will and purpose. In the other case, men are personal and have wills of their own. Thus, the possibility of opposition to the will of God. Secondly, God is sovereign. Ultimately, his purpose is for the universe will be achieved. But evil does exist and as a factor which is contrary to the will of God. And thirdly, God is gracious in that he brought salvation through his son. But three, some men are not saved. And the implication is, is that grace was not shown to them. And thus grace was bestowed arbitrarily. Before we go into uh, B2, I'd, uh, I think it's time to take a break. And so we'll take a break here and we'll come back when we get through. Okay. Okay. Just before the break, we talked about some factors in the situation. Uh, we talked about God's position, man's position, and it kind of sets us up for the tension that exists. Now, I guess I always feel like I have to make this kind of disclaimer. There's always the problem that I always feel when we go into these things, and I'll, I'm always glad when this particular section is over with because I don't have to deal with it as much as I used to through the rest of the particular book because once we start into Hebrews it begins to get into the salvational aspects of grace and not so much into the Calvinistic aspects of Calvinism versus Arminianism but it always appears that the book continually comes back to this point but the fact is is that this is a major point at the same time let's keep clearly in mind that when I speak about the Calvinist solution I'm speaking about a five-point Calvinist, okay? And, well, I guess I'll just go to the board on this one for a second. The idea is, is that over here we have uh, the ultra-Calvinist. Over here we have the ultra-Arminian. And clearly, the ultra-Calvinist may, may not be typical of John Calvin's position because Calvin only developed his position to a certain point 
And then from there, the others began to develop the doctrine even further. But the ultra Calvinist over here, and we'll just call, put a five up here for five point Calvinist. We'll put a five over here for the ultra Arminian, the five point Arminian. And then in somewhere in between is a mid ground that we've been trying to find. But from the ultra Calvinist, there are gradations that reach that mid ground. And likewise, for the ultra Arminian, the same thing is going on. So somewhere in here, there is a point where they cross over each other. And you really cannot tell the difference between the Calvinist and the Arminian. They just, they may only have slight variations dealing off of the doctrine. And yet at the same time, they don't have a lot of difficulty in coming together and discussing these things without major doctrinal dis differences. So keep clearly in mind that I'm not suggesting that we all go out and hunt down Calvinists uh, tonight and uh, string them all up or something. It's, uh, it's not my desire at all. They're your brothers and sisters in Christ. But the fact is, is that the Calvinist would reach a different solution to the tension that exists than the Arminian would. Keeping clearly in mind, too, that our book takes an Arminian slant, they have to approach the Calvinist position. So, under B, number two, the Calvinist solution. There's a number of points, and you may have to write kind of small to get these if you like to take detailed notes. First of all, under the Calvinist solution, Calvinists assert that man has no freedom not even to respond to the grace of God. Man has no freedom. He doesn't even have the freedom to respond to the grace of God. And the grace of God I'm speaking of is salvational. In other words, man is dead in his sins. And he has to be given the capacity to believe by God who gives this to the elect. I'll go back through that thought again. The Calvinist asserts that man has no freedom. Basically, the position is this, is that Adam had a free will while he was in the garden and while he existed in, in fellowship with God, he was a free will agent. But at the point where Adam sinned, then he no longer had a free will. And that his free will is reestablished at the point that he becomes regenerate, born again. So at first, man had a free will. He lost it with the fall. He regains it at the point where he is born again. So the Calvinists assert that man has no freedom, not even to respond to the grace of God. And of course, if you think back through the, through the things that we've already shared in the past weeks, part of the position is, is that they, you don't understand the conditions for accepting it in the first place, etc., etc. Christ only died, and it's only effectual to the elect. You can keep on going all the way down the line, all the way back to where we first began. But he is dead in sins. As a result, he must be given the capacity to believe by God. He has to be given the capacity to even come to God in faith. And God gives this to the elect, not to the non-elect. Number two. The Calvinists assert that God tolerates evil in his system so that good may come of it. The Calvinists assert that God tolerates evil in his system, in the world system, that good may come of it. 
And though God allows men to commit evil, they are responsible and bear the guilt for what they do and not God. Yet they are powerless to do otherwise. I'll back up and say that again. Though God allows men to commit evil, God holds men responsible. And man bears the guilt for what they do and not God. Even though men are powerless to do otherwise. Now, obviously, the question that should come to our mind is this, that if man has lost his free will, then who's the author of man's sin? Who's responsible for his sin? Who is morally responsible for the sin that man commits if he is powerless to do otherwise? If he cannot avoid sin, if he cannot find any way to deal with his sin, because he happens to be the non-elect, then who is morally responsible for that? Can man then be held morally responsible for an action that he has no options or choice over? Cannot operate or function as a free will agent. If he cannot function by his own free will, then who then by whose will does he function? If he cannot function in his own free will, if man is not free to respond or act in any way, then who is responsible for his actions? Who brings about every action that he takes? And yet, at the same time, he will be held responsible for those. Yeah. Yeah. Would they say that his actions are dominated by Satan? Is that what you're asking me? Okay, can Satan make you do anything? They would say that you are serving Satan and therefore worthy of judgment. If you're not serving God, you're serving Satan, therefore you are worthy of judgment. But all are sold under sin, both Jew and Gentile. All are guilty. According to Romans, constantly is making those comments that we are all guilty. And, and so the question is really not so much is man sinful? Obviously man is sinful. The question really is, is does man have the ability to understand the conditions for salvation and the ability to receive them? I don't think Satan forces you to do anything. You may choose to, to do other things and reject Christ, rejecting God likewise in the doing. But if you do, then you cho have chosen then to serve Satan and serve his purposes, not God's. That's right. In other words, election is unconditional. We can't know the conditions. Okay, thirdly, God is under no obligation to show grace to any guilty sinner. As far as the Calvinist is concerned, God is under no obligation to show grace to any guilty sinner. Therefore, he does no injustice in merely showing grace to some. It is not an injustice to show grace to some. God is not under obligation to show grace to any guilty sinner. In other words, that sin must be judged. So all are in a position to be judged. 
So if he chooses to save some, that is not an injustice. Should a man look for grace, he merely does so because God has appointed him to do so, according to the Calvinist. In other words, if a man seeks grace in his life, seeks to come to God, he merely does so because God has appointed him to do so and therefore has enabled him to do so. Now, the reason for this major position is because of the strength of the position of the Calvinist to the sovereignty of God. God must be totally sovereign in all cases. And if that's the case, then man cannot be a free will agent and resist the grace of God. Because if that's the case, God isn't sovereign. I beg to differ with that position. I believe that God can be totally sovereign in his establishment of the conditions for salvation and allow man then to respond. Now the Calvinist then, and this is not going to a new point, this is still under 2B2, so, and but this is a point I want to bring up about two different types of wills, which Sue has been waiting for a long time now. <laughs> and that is, first of all, the preceptive will and the decretive will. And I guess I probably should write these on the board. <laughs> the preceptive will is basically this. It's that will which expresses what God wants men to do. This is the will which expresses what God wants men to do. is his preceptive will. Then secondly, his decretive will. D-E-C-R-E-T-I-V-E. -E -E. Decretive will. And his decretive will is a secret will. It's only in the mind of God, in the secret counsels of God, within his own mind. So this will is secret. We can't know it. And this will expresses what he in fact resolves will happen. You can see precept and you can see decree in both of those, in the two words. God's precepts are those things which God wants men to do. He establishes precepts which directs men to do certain things. And so his preceptive will is that will which expresses what God wants men to do. These are the things that God wants men to do. His decretive will, on the other hand, which is secret and we cannot know it, is that will which uh, is what God has decided will happen. These are the things that are going to happen, no matter what, in God's will. Okay. The second one is always a what? Uh, it's always it's always part of the first one. There's there's nothing in the 
decree of will that won't be in the percentage. Yes, if you take it that way, yes. Okay. Uh, let's look at the difficulties then, B3, because, and I haven't left these yet, I'm coming back to these, so don't think, oh, he just laid these on us as a heavy revy and he's taking off now. That's not the case at all. Uh, the difficulties in the Calvinist solution. Among the objections is, first of all, number one, the problem of evil. The view that God can cause evil and suffering through human agents without himself being responsible is unsupportable. The difficulties with the position is this, that there is a view that God can cause evil and suffering through human free agents without himself being responsible. Uh, let's take a, a for instance. Probably the best one I could think of, although it's the most troublesome one, uh, and there's a good study, and I'd like not to have to go through the whole thing, uh, is Pharaoh. In other words, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. If God forced Pharaoh to be evil, then is Pharaoh responsible for his own responses, is the question. Would God do that? Would God use Pharaoh to bring about evil in the people, towards the people, to bring them back to him in a unity, to bond the people together, to strengthen them as a, as a nation, and bring them out? Or was Pharaoh operating as a free will agent? And that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was actually Pharaoh's response to God on his own free will choice. And that at some point, Pharaoh had brought himself to the point where he could no longer reverse himself. And God allowed him to do what he did. Yes. Yes, it does say that. And so an excellent study for you is in the word shazak, which is the word which is used for hardened. And it's in not your textbook, but in this Soteriology 1 book. There's a lot of Soteriology 1 that many people have not read. The book has got a lot of really good stuff in it. And it does a word study on shazak which is the word which they use for harden, as well as its application to Pharaoh in the earlier part of the book. And in each case, the word implies that Pharaoh was allowed and was operating and was functioning as a free will agent through that entire time and until at such point where he could not do anything else. And God simply allowed him his heart. So Pharaoh was still functioning as a free will agent. Whether or not God was actually acting on Pharaoh to harden his heart is a position that I personally feel the word supports that that was not the case. Although the Calvinist would assert otherwise. So the problem with evil, the view that God can cause evil and suffering through human agents without himself being responsible, is unsupportable. If caused by God is modified, so is foreordination or cause or determination. In other words, number two, the problem of the moral difficulty of double predestination, that any human, any human judge or father would be regarded as falling below the standards of Christian justice. We've got two things here. One is, is that would God hold responsible his insertion of evil or placing evil in a person's life to draw out a response from God's people in a positive way? 
In other words, does God use people as anything other than free moral agents? I don't believe you can prove it in Scripture personally. Uh, and secondly, how can God then be considered just if, if we consider that? In other words, any human judge or father would be regarded as falling below the standards of Christian justice if he dealt with his people in this particular way. In other words, let's take, uh, for instance, a father. And let's say he has a daughter, or two daughters, let's say. And let's say that he says, uh, one of my daughters is, uh, I've predetermined, is very bright and can go far. The other one I've predetermined is not nearly as bright and probably won't do much with her life. And therefore, because of that, he deals with that particular situation in that way. What if a judge, if two men came before a judge at separate times, of course, one man comes up with a certain set of circumstances which involved murder, and for one, he declared death. For the other, he declared uh, life imprisonment or whatever. In other words, God does not deal with his people in any other way than in complete and total impartiality. Everybody is dealt with in the same sense or the same way. One of the reasons why that's the, that can be the case is because all are in the same condition. All are sinful and thus deserve to be judged. If we limit the atonement, then what we've done is we've dealt with people in the same kind of way. If the atonement is only for a few, then we've dealt with the man who is going to have life imprisonment. We have the man who is going to die. One is going to have life, the other is going to have death. The third position is that God's decretive will is not so much his desire, but rather that the elect will do something which is predetermined. God's decretive will is not so much his desire, but rather that the elect will do something which is predetermined. We're talking about his decretive will here. And that, is, that is what God has decided will happen. It's not so much his desire, but rather that the elect will do something which is predetermined. His, yes, excuse me. Yeah. Yes, it's against the other position. His preceptive will, often not to be, not, his preceptive will will often not be obeyed. And therefore, his sovereignty is not obeyed. That becomes a problem. What he, des what he desires is not accomplished, in other words. Expressed what God wants men to do, but they may not do it. God would have that all men come to him but all may not do it. Indeed, all will not do it. So we seem to have a problem with God's sovereignty then. What God wants is not going to happen. What he desires is not accomplished. So second, we have to fall back on his decretive will. If this is the case, his decretive will and his preceptive will are in contradiction to one another. He gives man the precept, believe in Jesus. He gives man the precept, believe in Jesus. And at the same time, his decretive will resolves that this man is not of the elect and therefore cannot obey his preceptive will. Follow what I'm saying? Okay. 
So what we have then is we have God in conflict with himself then. And as far as I'm concerned, God is not a God of confusion. And this is confusion. If God's preceptive will is that you believe in Jesus and his decretive will is that I'm sorry you can't, you got a problem. You got God's will in conflict with each other. Well, let's look at C then, the causes of the difficulties. First is the fact of evil. First is the fact that evil exists. It's not caused by God, but lies in the creation in its lack of good purpose and its opposition to God. And I think that's a good point. I've done some things with teaching a little bit about evil. First of all, evil is not created. It is my personal belief that evil is not created. Because I do not believe that if God had created evil, he would have pronounced it good. And everything that he, pr he created, he pronounced good. So therefore, I do not believe evil was a created thing. Yes. Okay. If that's the case, then where does evil get its, where does evil get its quality? First of all, evil couldn't exist until the creation. There had to be created beings before there could be evil. Did God create evil in them? Not if he pronounced them good. So they were not created evil, either the angels nor man. But it says that evil was found in Lucifer. Evil was found in him. What does it mean? I think basically the idea of evil is this, that evil is that which is actively opposed to God. In other words, at the point that Lucifer became opposed to God, evil was being expressed. In other words, evil finds its expression in free will moral agents who actively choose to go against God. And therefore, evil finds its expression in its opposition to God. It took place in Lucifer. It took place over and over again ever since. The second one I'd like to take from your text on page 139, and that's the clash of decretive and preceptive wills, which we've already talked about to a degree. <clears throat> on page 139, about the middle of the book, or on the middle of the page, it says uh, the reason why. That where the paragraph begins, the reason why the Calvinist does this. The reason why the Calvinist does this is because he wants to insist that God is sovereign over all things. And so that's my position with you. John Calvin's position was the sovereignty of God that must be preserved at all costs. So the reason why the Calvinist does this is because he wants to insist that God is sovereign over all things and that his will is always done. He thinks that this can be done only by claiming that God predetermines all that happens. Now that means that then that everything, this is what's called a deterministic view. In other words, God determines that all of these things are going to happen. No matter what it is, all of these things are going to happen. And what we then in the process of living, we don't perceive it as that. We just perceive it as things happening. But in this particular case, this is simply God determining each particular instance and in, in thing that takes place in our lives. This solution does not work 
because it creates a clash between what God desires, his preceptive will, and his so-called prescriptive will, or preceptive will, it's called both, preceptive or prescriptive will, and what actually happens. It is not true that everything that happens is what God desires. But further, this solution arises because the Calvinist cannot see any possibility of God's will being done other than by predetermination of all that happens. Therefore, it preserves the sovereignty of God. There is, however, another way in which God's will can be sovereign, and that is by reason of its superior power so that God can place his will over against ours and say, you may want to do X, but you shall do Y. In other words, we see our wills in relationship to God's will. And this is how the Bible portrays the ultimate victory of God. He will be all in all when all creatures bow down before his will and obey it willingly or unwillingly, not because their wills have been predetermined to obey it, but because they have to bow to a superior power. A solution to the problem of predestination must do justice to the way in which the Bible speaks of God as one who places his will over against ours and acts like another person rather than as a being who does not enter into real relationships with his creatures but simply treats them as the unconscious objects of his secret will. This does not mean, however, that we can do away with predestinarian language. We may illustrate this point by referring to prayer. The Bible commands us to pray that God's will may be done, as if this was dependent on our prayers. Prayer influences God. We can, of course, say that we pray because God wills that he should be moved to act in response to the prayers which he himself has moved us to make. But this reply reduces God to the level of a dramatist or a person who simply directs the actors on a stage. But prayer also influences men in that, for example, the work of preaching the gospel effectively depends upon the intercession of the people of God. The wills of men can thus be affected by prayer, or else we would not pray for them. To believe in prayer is thus to believe in some kind of limitation of human freedom and in some kind of incomprehensible influence upon the wills of men. So we do believe that God in influences us. We do believe that he brings things into our lives. But the fact is, is that we don't necessarily see that we have to respond in one particular way or another without seeing clearly God's will set against ours. And then we still have the position of obedience. We still then have to decide, do we obey or do we disobey? He goes into, uh, the author goes into some pattern in here that uh, is supposed to give you a, a direction. I found it a little confusing, but he goes on to say this raises a problem of different kind. Does A have a better chance of salvation than B because X prays for A and not for B? Uh, that's a good question. If someone prays for one person and not another, does that person have a better chance of salvation than the other? But this is part of the general problem of theodicy that a person in Birmingham or Boston has a better chance of hearing the gospel than one in Borneo or Bangladesh. We must freely admit that there is an element of mystery here and not try to tone down either aspect of the language of the Bible. 
When the author finally enters and uses the word mystery, and mystery simply means that it is something that we cannot seem to solve by our own ability to reason or to use logic to understand, then what we've really done is we've entered into the realm of the supernatural, which says that man just can't know. And ultimately, many times, we find ourselves there. But in each case, the one thing that I hope that we've caught through the section is that predestination does not appear to be predestination to heaven or hell. That predestination really seems to speak to something much different than that. And even though there are many problems, the Calvinist solution is not necessarily totally correct because we set God's wills against each other and we tend to make God the author of evil and the author of rebellion, the author of sin. And it's difficult then to hold man morally responsible for his actions if indeed they are all determined by God. Okay. Next week, uh, we'll go into the soteriology of Hebrews, and we'll look at it in a biblical perspective. Obviously, I won't be here. Uh, you'll get the chance of the modern genius of video and uh, get the chance to hear what we did the last time I taught this. Uh, that'll be the case for the next two weeks. And then when I come back, we'll jump right in the big middle of eternal security. And I uh, always love that one because everybody's just sitting there just waiting for that one. They just, you know, What's this guy going to say? Are we eternally secure or are we not? Uh, and it's not in your book, so that's another neat part of it. It's totally a lecture class. And then uh, we'll have a chance to review and get ready for the test at the same time. Okay. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer then and uh, uh, just finish up this evening with discussion if you'd like. Let's pray. Father, uh, I just thank you for this evening. I think sometimes in prayer my words uh, just uh, kind of fail me. I know how difficult some of this is and how repetitious much of this is. But at the same time, I think it's important that we understand where others are coming from in their theology and that we understand clearly how to see ourselves within the relationship of that theology. So, Lord, make our paths clear. Help us to understand and see clarity, Father, and to perhaps take these things and apply them in our lives, Father, that we will be indeed stronger, stronger in our faith, stronger in, in our walks, Father. And indeed, we can stand against false doctrine, stand against the theologies that might come at us that are indeed wrong, Lord. Your word just does not seem to support those things, Lord. Father, may we always use your word as the final judge, not the things that we feel like we have to logically reason but, Father, let's not be ashamed of the fact that, indeed, some things are mysteries, Father, because you have not opened them up clearly to us. Some things we will just find out when we come home and we're with you. Father, we just thank you again for this night and for this chance to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ.
Lord, be with us as we go our separate ways and just bring us back together safely, Father. Just ask these things now in Jesus' name. We hope you've enjoyed this video presentation. If you have any questions or prayer requests or would like a catalog of available audio,